everyone and good morning. Uh, no, I did not buy a Jeep Cherokee. Uh, this is actually a rental vehicle. I'm traveling for work right now. So I thought this would be a good time to go ahead and throw out an update. Uh, I know I haven't done a video in a long time and I apologize to everyone who subscribes for the content and tries to get updates on, you know, what's going on with the Mercedes vehicles and everything. Um, so we actually bought a house and we sold a house at the same time. Um, and that happened um, you know, early winter to late winter, early spring, that whole process. Um, if anybody has sold a house or bought a house, especially in the crazy market uh, we're kind of coming out of right now, you know what I'm talking about. It's, it's absolutely nuts. Uh, so that took a lot of my time trying to get our house ready for the market and get it sold and then purchasing a house and doing all the things that we wanted to do to it. So we were able to fire our dream house and we knew that you know, if we didn't move on it quickly, um, you know, the, the way the market's going, uh, the interest rates were gonna get a little bit too high and uh, potentially we would lose the opportunity to, you know, to, to have our dream home. So uh, we did that, uh, we put our house on the market, we got it sold, we bought a new house. So anyway, that's kind of what's really occupied my time uh, for the last several months. And then of course, things happen when you get a new house and, you know, been messing with, mowers that have been broke and just all kinds of crazy stuff but we're on a little bit of acreage now and so we really enjoy it out there but uh it has obviously uh, taken a toll on my ability to to record content and i actually have content uh for the w123 some um but i'll kind of share updates with you guys on that and i don't actually have my windshield mount with me um so in this cherokee there's a little like storage compartment and i just kind of have the phone stuck in there so hopefully everything's coming through okay and i'm at the right angle i might end up just deleting this whole thing and starting over at a different time but you know if it comes out okay we'll roll with it but uh, i'll go ahead and give you an update on the 123 here uh you know i was going to check out you know the injectors and check out the uh, uh look at the excuse me the uh valve clearance and everything uh, so I'll just go ahead and update you on that right now. I'll show you a couple of clips that I've got of that. Okay, folks, I have just finished the valve adjustment on this OM617 turbo diesel. It's an 85-300D. And as you know, it's kind of, it's, it's shaking a little bit at idle. Um, it does start quick, which is kind of reassuring, but the shaking at idle and the missing, um, I was kind of hoping that, I'd get in here and I'd have a bunch of valves that were just really, really tight. And, you know, the problem would be solved. Uh, unfortunately, as we know, that isn't always the way that it works, right? Um, so on these, basically you're going exhaust intake, intake, exhaust, and then it just repeats. And you can see those little black dots on the oiler tube that just lets me know that I'm done. But we had a few intake valves that were pretty loose. Um, had a few intake valves that were measuring, you know, about 0 .007, 0 .008, which is, you know, twice the clearance that they're supposed to have. You're looking for 0 .004 on the intake side and uh, 0.013 on the exhaust side. The exhaust side was pretty good. And when I opened this up, I looked on the oiler tube. I had already wiped it off, but uh, I looked on the oiler tube and you could see you could almost see a little remnants where somebody had taken a Sharpie and they put IE, uh, you know, in a corresponding, you know, intake and exhaust valve. So somebody's been in here somewhat recently. And uh, so it's kind of disappointing. I was really hoping that I was gonna get in here and, uh, you know, adjust these valves and it was really gonna straighten everything out. But, oh well, uh, on to the next, the next phase, which will be uh, pulling those uh, injectors and bench testing those injectors uh, because I don't imagine we're gonna see a lot of difference um, I'm glad it's done uh, it still needed to be done because I did like I said I had some intake valves that were opened up a little bit um, I think I think three of the intake valves were opened up so um, it's good that I did it um, I just don't really think that we're gonna see much of a difference so on to the next phase okay here we are at the bench tester and let's just go ahead and push this thing up a little bit. Yeah, look at that. Right about 1750. 
Now, looking at the spray pattern, it's not too bad. And it's kind of been the same with all five of these. And while that's fairly normal, fairly common to be down on pressure like that, it's still not necessarily good. Um, it would probably be okay to leave them, but uh, just so we're starting fresh, we're going to go ahead and replace these injectors because a sign of a worn out injector is low pressure. So let's, uh, let's get these injectors replaced and see what we've got. Okay, so I sure am glad I decided to test these injectors before I install them because if you look... That is really high, so I don't know. This is frustrating, folks, because it has taken me a month to get these injectors. Um, but yeah, here we are. You know, about 2200 PSI, and these are supposed to be about 1950, so. And they're, they're consistent, all of them, so. I'm going to have to try to figure out what's going on with these. So because it took a month to get those injectors, um, and that's kind of a long story, it took two weeks to receive each shipment, and the first shipment showed up as an empty box. So that was wonderful, and the uh, vendor did try to make it right and send another set out to me. Um, the shipment was insured, so I can, uh, that kind of helps protect him. But it took another two weeks, so this car's been down a month waiting for injectors, and it looks like I got the wrong ones. I think he probably accidentally sent me the 145 bar um, injectors that he has for upgraded engines, and I'm not upgraded at all. I don't want to go that route. I wanted stock injectors. So uh, rather than waiting another couple of weeks for a set of injectors, the spray pattern's pretty good on these. Nothing really uh, outstanding. Uh, wrong with them. Nothing just jumping out at me. Just down a little bit on pressure, about 200 PSI uh, across the board, but they are fairly well balanced. Um, I would prefer to go new, and maybe I'll do that again like next spring or something like that, but for now I'd like to get this car back together and get it running again. So I'm going to reuse the old injectors, just clean them up a little bit. And uh, one thing that I wanted to talk about real quick while I'm putting these injectors back in, um, when I was removing the injectors, they were incredibly tight. I mean, it took everything I had, especially on number five, to get that thing loose, and the rest of them were really, really tight, too. These injectors tighten to, uh, you know, between 51 and 59 PSI, something like that. Um, it's, uh, it's recommended in Newton meters, and I'd have to double check, uh, maybe, you know, 70 to 90 Newton meters, but, um, uh, the reason why that's not really important is because I basically just took that, converted it into foot-pounds, and I'm just using the middle measurement. So about 55, 56 foot-pounds is all it needs. And I'm telling you what, so here with my left arm pushing away from me, I'm going to show you what that looks like. That's it right there. And that's and I'm, I'm literally just pushing on this thing a little bit. So folks... Uh, Pay attention to torque values, please, especially when you're talking about, you know, something like this where you could have, um, you could have diesel fuel leaking. Uh, you could cause some problems down in there by over-tightening these. They have those heat washers, those little crush washers down there. Um, you don't want to over-tighten these, so just uh, snug them down to the recommended torque measurements, and you should be good to go. That's what Mercedes used from the factory, so I don't know why we deviate from it, but I just wanted to touch on that, and we're going to get this thing back together and get it running again. So here we are back together. Um, it's, you know, it sounds really bizarre, but after it initially purged all the air, and what I did basically is I just, I hooked up all the injector lines to the delivery valves on the injection pump and finger tight, and then I finger tightened all the injector lines and then tightened the injection pump delivery valve lines but I left the injector lines loose you know at the injectors and then I just cranked it over a little bit and I'd come out and check it crank it over a little bit come out and check it and after doing that three or four times 
you start to see a little fuel weeping around, you know, around those nuts at the injectors, and that's how you know that you've got all the air out of the system. Now I know with the OM617, I've heard that they'll kind of purge the air automatically, but there's no reason to stress your battery and your starter and everything. You're already, you already have the lines off, so just don't tighten them, crank it over a few times, let it get some of the air out of the system. And I, as soon as I tighten those things up, held the glow plug igniter for a little bit and it fired right up so that's the best way to do it in my opinion but now i'm just kind of looking to see make sure that i have everything snug kind of looking around those nuts uh, everything looks really dry everything that i've done with that top of those nuts um but now what i was going to say is this sounds really weird and it, it, it is still shaking a little bit but I don't know if just cleaning the injectors up helped a little bit but it, it definitely seems smoother than it was um, it's still not right still got a little little hazing smoke coming out but um, you know we'll, we'll we'll keep working with this thing it's I'm getting frustrated just because I thought you know I'd buy this old diesel and do a valve adjustment and check the injectors and something would scream at me like hey you know the injection they are the uh the injectors are not spraying right or or you know the valves are way out of adjustment so far nothing so uh the next step might be doing a compression test and see what kind of help we're dealing with on this engine but i think before that let's get it up to operating temperature let's change the oil put some fresh i'll probably use like a Chevron Dello 1540, use some fresh oil and just run it and run it pretty hard and make sure that we've got the rings are all seated and everything's good and uh, you know we'll go from there but who knows the history of this thing, who knows how much it's been driven recently so it might just need that but we'll see. Um, it does start right up so there's, there's some hope for it but uh, it's still not quite right so uh, stay tuned folks, we'll, we'll definitely be addressing any issues that come up with this one more thing that makes me really happy uh this is my garage floor so those two spots were from my buick uh the grand national it had a little bit of a transmission leak but um the mercedes has been sitting here for over a month and uh really nothing <laughs> so i guess that's one positive uh, most of these old mercedes diesels seem to leak really bad and this one doesn't at all so that's a plus huh all right here we are with a functional temperature gauge i love it um tachometer works heck even the clock works um pulled out the instrument cluster i was able to switch it over uh just on the uh on the speedometer and the tachometer those were already functional uh you know i was able to to acquire the the other side and I just left it all in the housing because my housing had a crack in it up toward the top but here we are functional temperature gauge speedometer tachometer clock oil pressure fuel everything everything works I can't tell if the if the instrument cluster lighting works because it's daylight but I might have to pop it back out and replace some bulbs if that's not functional but it's no big deal I don't have to take it all the way out to do that so yeah, I'm happy about that this is a actually a great driving car um, it's hard to believe 250,000 miles and it just kind of floats down the road and really comfortable to drive it has plenty of power um, I know the 240d's everybody says they're extremely difficult to live with in modern traffic but um, as far as the 300d turbo goes I think it's just fine. Plenty of pickup. So the next issue I'm chasing is a wiring issue with the headlight. Um, the passenger side low beam specifically, which is on the same circuit as the fog lamps. And it had a blown fuse. Again, I don't really know much about the history of this car. So the first thing I did, obviously, was just throw a fuse in there and see what happens. And um, I turned the low beams on, 
and the driver's side headlight works fine. But the passenger side headlight did not come on at all. And when, then when I tried the fog lamps, it blew the fuse. So that tells me there's some sort of a short, something going to ground uh, with one of those fog lamps. I'll have to dig into a little bit more. And I don't know if the headlamp not coming on is a circuit issue as well. It must be, but I, uh, I did replace the headlight just so I can eliminate that. The old one had a crack in it anyway, so but let me show you what I did. Um, so basically, I grounded my test light to one side of the fuse circuit, and then I just probed the other side. And if I turn on my headlights, you can see there, I have one headlight. You can see the reflection in the toolbox. But the other side, nothing. You can see that the test light is not lit up. But let me show you what happens when I turn the fog lights on. Okay, so that tells me that obviously something is going to ground in that fog light circuit. So I'm going to have to chase some wires and figure that out. That should be a lot of fun. Okay, so I found a couple of issues here. One, uh, whoever had this car last um, didn't really have any clue what they were doing. There are a lot of these fuses that are wrong. So I'm going to have to go through each one and I'll probably just replace each one. Whenever you're doing this, folks, just buy a lot of fuses. Don't just buy one off eBay like, oh, I just need to replace this one fuse. Just get all new fuses and I, I'm just going to go through and replace all of them. And I'm going to replace all of them with the proper fuses because these are mixed and matched. Uh, for this circuit, it is actually number 11. It's the red one uh, right there in between two white ones on the top. That is the low beam and fog light circuit. So I'll show you what I found. Whenever I unplugged, whenever I took this door off rather, I unplugged this light. And there are a lot of different little spade connectors in here that were just kind of bunched up. And I'm sure they were grounding up against something. Uh, either inside this headed light assembly or or maybe even up against here. I'm not sure, but uh, you can see there's tape on that. I mean, it's this thing. Somebody's been into the wiring on this, and they obviously didn't do a very good job. So I'll go through and I'll I'll use a proper weatherproof butt splice on these connections and see if I can get this fog light working. But looky there, I have low beam and I have uh, fog light, and those connections on that side did need to be cleaned. Um, it looked like I would just had a little bit of a loose connection. There's a plug, a four-prong plug on the back. Right there, that little black box. And it wasn't getting continuity for that low beam to work. So, But after putting the proper red 16-amp fuse in there, somebody had a blue 25-amp in there, uh, looks like we're up and going with the headlights. I just need to do a little bit of splicing and uh, we'll get that other fog light working, hopefully. So here we are. Um, you know, I didn't even need to do anything. I didn't need to splice anything. I didn't, the guy had these jumper wires just unprotected, just laying in there. I don't know if he just wasn't happy with the amount of wiring that was given from the factory so he wanted to extend them i don't know i don't this guy the park lamp uh when i first got in here this park lamp was in op so the first thing i thought was i'll replace the bulb but uh uh looking at the bulb it looked fine so i just started playing with the wires and it was just plugged in wrong like it had a sequence of wiring that was plugged in wrong so i don't know what this guy was doing but uh, we're up and going, so I'm going to get this headlight door back on here, and we'll call that done. Okay, so that's kind of where we're at with that. Uh, you can see um, the broken uh, temperature gauge. I just replaced that whole uh, left side. Um, I did end up repairing some faulty lights uh, in the cluster, um, and it wasn't actually the bulbs. Um, so in those, there's a potentiometer in those and oftentimes it'll go bad 
they're not bright anyway, even on the brightest settings. So what I did was I just bypassed the two posts. I just jumped those together, uh, which basically locks it into that, that brightest setting. You can never dim it, but if you have a 123 and the cluster bulbs are too bright for you on the brightest setting, you are a crazy person. Uh, because on the brightest setting, they are still pretty dim. So I wasn't too concerned with losing the ability to, uh, to dim those. I just went ahead and locked them together and they're as bright as they can be uh, permanently now. So um, checking the valve adjustment or uh, adjusting the valves and checking the valve clearance, you can see that there's really nothing there. Uh, same kind of with the injectors, the the spray pattern was really good, and to me that's probably more important at this point than just being a little bit down on pressure. Um, I believe it was Kent Bergsma I had spoke to about it, um, said that it's actually it's it's rather normal for uh, you know a used set of injectors that that have quite a bit of mileage on them uh, to be down you know, 150 PSI or so, and it's really not gonna hurt anything. It should still run smooth. Uh, you know, the car still starts really quick. And, um, the main thing was just trying to get that shake out. Well, just cleaning those up a little bit, which you can just get a brass brush. You don't wanna get any sandpaper or anything that's gonna damage the metal. Um, but to clean some of that carbon off, um, it's a good idea to you know, get a, a brass brush, something that won't damage the, the injectors and get those cleaned up. And I think that helped a lot, really. Driving it around a little bit, it seems to have smoothed out a lot. Um, now the car is not without problems. Um, it, it was an unloved, poorly maintained example of a quarter million mile W123. So I knew that going in that there were gonna be problems, but my goodness, fighting. Uh, so many vacuum issues and then brake calipers that are stuck and just one thing after another <clears throat> I've decided that it's probably not a smart idea To use that as a daily driver and I've actually just been driving my truck uh, Just because it's not at this point. It's not a reliable car and I haven't had the time to give it You know the love that it needs and originally I had planned to just do whatever it takes but again you know, the situation with the houses and everything, I've fallen so far behind, and the the Mercedes projects have kind of taken a back seat. But, you know, the 124 has since been turned over to my stepson. Uh, he turned 16 in March, so he's enjoying the 124. Nothing wrong with it, it's still a wonderful car. Uh, the 108 has been a wonderful car. We have it out of storage since we have some more um, garage space now. Uh, we're able to keep it at home and still park our daily drivers in a different garage. And so we have two different garages in the house and and uh, we have enough storage to keep several vehicles under roof. So that helps a lot. And the 123 has just kind of taken a back seat. And uh, because of that, I've, I've fallen really far behind and I've decided I'm probably just gonna go ahead and sell the 123 and I'm going to move into another video series um, that, that everyone might enjoy because the, the W212 series of all the YouTube videos that I've done, and I'm not like some big YouTuber, I haven't done, you know, I don't have a ton of subscribers. I appreciate all you guys who have subscribed, but uh, I'm not in the thousands of subscribers or anything like that. But I, the, most popular by a landslide have been the uh, W212 series on owning a Mercedes-Benz out of warranty. Seems like everybody really enjoyed that. And I saw a lot of, you know, subscriptions uh, during that time and a lot of comments and a lot of views, obviously. So because of the immense popularity of that, that YouTube series, you know, owning a Mercedes Benz out of warranty, which I'm glad because the popularity means that people are getting some use out of it, right? Like that's the whole reason why I did that series is because I couldn't find it myself. When I was looking for, 
you know, a Mercedes Benz that was, you know, approaching 10 years old and out of warranty, I wanted to know what people were running into because the, there's such a stigma around used Mercedes that, you know, when you own one out of warranty, it's going to cost you so much, you know, to maintain and to keep it on the road and, and costly repairs are right around the corner. And it's just a, it's a ticking, ticking time bomb. And, you know, my, as you can see from my experience in that video series, that wasn't the case at all. It was a wonderful car and I really enjoyed it, but I don't normally keep vehicles. I know a lot of people were disappointed uh, to hear that I sold that or I traded it in, <clears throat> but I needed a truck at the time. So, and I just kind of, as my wants and needs change, I just change vehicles. And if you buy vehicles right, you can do that. It doesn't cost you anything. Sorry, I lost my phone. I had a feeling that was going to happen. I hit a low spot in the bridge and boom, just fell off of that, that little storage cubby that's holding up. But uh, yeah, there was nothing wrong with that W212. Matter of fact, my girlfriend has a 2015 um, E350. Now she loves it. We've had no problems with it. Um, I might give you a walk around on that thing. It's it's a beautiful black uh, E350 uh, with the AMG appearance package and all that. But uh, no, I loved that car. It just didn't suit my needs anymore at the time. Um, I needed a truck for some things, so I traded it in. I got a Ranger, and then uh, we decided to take a long family vacation, and uh, the Ranger no longer suited my needs, so I traded it in on a... Uh, 2021 Ram. I actually didn't trade it in. I sold it to Carvana because at the time Carvana, everything was going nuts. And, and, uh, I actually drove that truck for two years at Ranger and I put 18,000 miles on it and Carvana bought it for what I paid for it. So I, I'd have been dumb not to, and I went ahead and got a 2021 Ram and that's what I have now. So it just, I, as my needs and my wants change, I just change vehicles. And if you if you buy them right and sell them right, it's fine. It doesn't hurt you to do that. Um, so that's often what I do. But now I'm getting to where, since I've given up the W124, I don't want to put a ton of miles on my truck. I didn't buy it to commute back and forth to work and put a ton of miles on. You know, I bought it for family vacations and for hauling cars. I've had a car trailer behind it several times. Uh, since I bought it, it's it's served those purposes well. But as far as a commuter vehicle, that's not why I bought it. I don't want to mile it up real bad, and obviously, it's not the greatest thing on fuel. So I'd like to get something different um, now that the 124 is gone. So shoot, I might end up doing another uh, video series, and it it might not be a Mercedes. I, I want it to be, um, and I know the Mercedes content seems to be pretty popular, um, probably just because there isn't a ton of it. Um, out there on YouTube. Uh, a lot of people are scared of used Mercedes and, you know, for whatever reason, um, you know, some of the guys, Pierre Hadari and Kent Bergsma and some of those guys that do uh, basically specialize in, in Mercedes content, you know, if you watch those guys, you realize what wonderful vehicles these classic Mercedes are, but I'm getting into a little bit more modern vehicles than that. Um, I would like a, maybe a 2009, a 211 chassis. And if I do that, I promise you guys, you will see... 2.0 uh, video series on, uh, you know, owning a Mercedes-Benz product out of warranty, uh, 2.0, if you will. So that might be kind of fun, but it, they're tough to find. Um, there are some issues with the earlier 211s, and I don't want an early 211. Um, I know there are some issues with uh, even, a, you know, the, the mid to later 211s with the M272 and 273 uh, timing gears, uh, you know, the balance shaft sprocket on the V6 and the idler sprocket on the V8, um, they had some poor materials that were causing early engine failures. So I don't want those either. Um, but like a 2009 E350, I'm in. So if I can find one of those that's been well taken care of and I can find it for a good price, um, you know, maybe around that 100,000 mile or a little over 100,000 mile mark, even up to 140, 150,000 miles, if it's been cared for, I'm good with that. Because I know if these cars are taken care of, they'll last. Um, so that's kind of what I'm on the hunt for. And let's wait and see. Uh, looking to do something maybe within the next couple of weeks. So, <coughs> excuse me. I would like to do that. And uh, if and when I do, I will obviously share that with you guys. So look for more of that content coming up. And until then, take care and I'll talk to you soon.